I'm going to ask Ron to come up. Now, now Jim Davidson didn't know this, but Jim, I had you in my mind. So he's going, Jim, if you would join us, you're going to be his guardian angel. Now envision this. You're lucky. To, I thought about getting a little pair of wings and putting them on Jim's back. You know what? But uh, and Jim, all right, come, come up here. Ron, Ron is is our sheep, and of course, with the name, with with the name Ron, he has to be Ronald McSheep, right? Okay. <clears throat> Now, it'll become obvious why in a minute, why I have a guardian angel, because as Ron becomes crippled and blind and everything else, he may need some help. I'm not caring. You don't care. <laughs> uh, all I ask, if he falls on someone, deflect him. Oh, okay. Yeah, he can, you know. Yeah, he can fall, but he's on the ground. Now, the other first little prop in this is going to be, I thank you, whoever brought the M&Ms. I needed chocolate, so the Halloween candy, I pilfered one packet. Do you, you, don't, you don't get one. Maybe by the end of it, if you're saved, okay? <laughs> so here is this packet, and this, these M&Ms actually represent something. But in dealing with the situation, we say God is working all around Ronald McSheep. He is here. He is doing something somewhere. Now, when it's all working the way it should, how many ways can Ronald see me working somewhere? He, he can see me. So if he's really astute, he can see in circumstances, he can see me working. Or maybe not see me working. He can hear me when I call him. There's a lot of ways that this could work. Now, this is going to throw you, it's going to take you a while to catch onto this, but let's put this model to the test in physical form. Here is Ronald in a relationship with the Good Shepherd. And, and I'll be that you gotta use your imagination for that one, but I get to be the Good Shepherd. He's in the relationship. So the Good Shepherd is working, and, and I just found, you know, he's working over here because Carol really needs some work. Have you, everybody's supposed to clap in it. You're lucky, Carol. They think you're all right. But let's say I'm working over here with Carol. And, I, and you know, Carol is in Ronald McSheep's circle of life. So he's in her world. And I say, Ronald, I'm working over here. Come and join me. I invite you to join me as I work with Carol. And here he comes. And Carol thinks he's up to something no good with those ears on. But there he is. <laughs> <coughs> When we get together and we're here, you know what we do besides helping Carol? I say, I, I, as a good shepherd, if you looked at the title of the sermon, it's the chocolate loving shepherd. So it's the nature of the shepherd just loves chocolate. Chocolate, I'm all about chocolate. Say, Ronald, have a chocolate as we're working over here. And I have a chocolate, right? <laughs> I say, I didn't sound... Okay, that's scary, James. <laughs> I know. How <laughs> oh, scary. Hmm. Right now, what's happening? Well, somebody informed me this is Mars chocolate. And Ron is eating it. I'm having one. We're having a good time. We're saving Carol. We're going to wait here. And there's something that's in me that's also in Ron. Something that's in Ron that's also in me. Hmm, what could that represent? We'll work on that later. This is how it's supposed to be. This is how the Christian life is supposed to work. I might move. I might go over, and, and you know, God's now working with Brenda, and I could say, come and work with me. He sees, he hears, he comes, and we, yeah, get up. No more chocolate for you. Yeah, you should have gotten one there. So, well, let's reset the, the situation here. Oh, well, that's just great. I know, Ron knows why he was trying to get a second one, because it gets, <laughs> gets scary after this. Is, you know, the problem is, is that we're not always that astute. As a matter of fact, there are things we can do in life that really set us back. We're going to mention a few of them in the parable. Oh, there goes your voice. <laughs> Let's try this one on. Uh, Ronald listens, but he's not all that consistent. He hears me every seventh time. So I can count on him listening and catching my voice one time out of seven. So let's see how that would work. Well, 
I find that it's time that Kitsy needs uh, a, a little work from the Lord over here, and I come out. Spot one. He doesn't like <laughs> <laughs> So, Ronald, come and join me. Spot two, Ronald, come and join me. Spot three, Ronald, come and join me. Spot four, Ronald, come and join me. Spot five, Ronald, come and join me. Spot six, Ronald, come and join me. Ah, finally, spot seven, Ronald, come and join me. So Ronald's on his way to spot seven, but guess what? Time is moving. Ronald makes it to spot seven, and then all of a sudden I'm here, Ronald, come and join me at one. Ronald, come and join me at two, three, four, five, six. Ronald is only making every second, seventh step. Can Ronald ever be where God is? He can be where God was, but he'll never be where God is. Let's reset again. Good thing that guardian angel is keeping you on yeah. track. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of scary, isn't it? <laughs> Steph goes on in life, and we said one of the things is people see where God is working in circumstances. What happens if we start bouncing out those senses? Here is a deluxe pair of um, blackout glasses we got for Ron. Blackaby. Blackaby glasses. <laughs> so, all right. The, yeah, your ears were upside down. There. <laughs> a lot of things happen when you're blind like that. So Ron, he's just really missing the one sense he can't see. Well, now what happens if God's working and everything, just the idea he doesn't see where he's working. What if now I invite him and say, Ron, come and join me over here as I work here. Okay, well, you know, we're finished there, Ron. That's to take you too long. So I'm working over here now, Ron. Ron, where are you, Ron? I'm working. I'm inviting you over, Ron. No, that's not, that's not where I'm working. No, no. <laughs> Wow, Ron never got anywhere near where I was working. He wanted to, but he didn't see. He just couldn't go. Well, let's give Ron his sight back. And speaking of ears, that's right. Sometimes you don't see where God's working yet. Sometimes you hear where he's calling you. He's telling you something. And sometimes that voice get, gets muffled out. What happens when the voice gets muffled out? Well, hmm. Okay, Ron, read my lips. <laughs> <laughs> Only come when you hear me. Okay, he's got it. So how does that work? This is very important. I'm working with Carol again. And sometimes God not only... Is he speaking? It's a still, small whisper. There's a reason we call it quiet time, right? When we're talking to God in prayer. Ron, Ron, come and join me, Ron. Ron, where are you? Not coming. Ron, Ron! I finally get him over here after I had to shout in his face to get him here. Sometimes God works like that. What happens when we're not hearing God? One more thing that can go wrong. Let's give Ron his hearing back. Ron can see it as in his relationship with God and he can hear in his relationship with God. But he never moves. He, he never exercises his faith. There's a word we have, you nurses would know, the word atrophy. It's when things just start shriveling up because they're not used. Well, I didn't want, I wanted to cripple Ron, but, you know, just for the service. So we're going to simulate crippling. I'm going to ask Ron, he's just going to take this rubber band and tie it just under his knees uh, and, and get down there. Here is Ron, good heart. He sees things, he hears things, but he has a real aversion to going out of his comfort zone. When it comes to really walking in faith, not so much. Great at sitting, even kneeling sometimes, but not too good at following and walking in faith. How would this affect someone? He sees me, he hears me. I come out 
Audrey needs a lot of help here for some reason, so I'm back working. And, and Audrey, I'm working here, and I say, Ron, you see me, you hear me, come and work with me, Ron, come. Before, oh, it's too late, Audrey's done, we can't, you know, this, but he never did get here. Here's Ed, Ed's, Ed's, we're working with Ed, come, work with me. And he's on his way, but pretty slow. Now, I did this last for a reason. Ron, can you hobble back with the, your guardian angel there? In all these cases, the best Ron could possibly do was be where I was. He could never be where I am. In many cases, he didn't even have a clue where I was. The thing about all of these different flaws that can happen to us as Christians trying to follow the Lord is they support each other, they interact with each other. So the real disturbing fact is you don't just have one. You tend to have them all if you let things get out of hand, if you're not paying attention. So let's, let's get that picture on. Let's, yeah, guardian angel, you better stay close. I don't know which one of these you want to first. You want to be blinded or deafened first? Yeah, yep, blind first. Yeah, well, the guardian angel doesn't want him to be blind, but he is. And, and so here is, here is Ron suffering from everything. So on top of all of this, I'm going to ask Ron, just as he can kind of hear me, is that Ron, on top of all of this, only answer every seventh time. How is he going to do? Ron, I'm at point one. Ron, I'm two. Ron, I'm at point three. I'm at four. I'm at five. I'm at six. I'm at seven. What chance does he have to follow God? What chance does he have to follow? <laughs> Ron, you're looking real pathetic. You can undo all the stuff now. And that was great in the first services we did this. That's exactly what they said. I said, what chance, I'll help you out a little bit here. Um, what chance do you, does he have of following God? And to the person they all went, not a chance. Not a chance. Now you know why Ron only got one chocolate. Thank you, guardian angel, as well. So what does all of this mean? Kind of a fun thing. Everybody was just waiting for Ron to fall on his nose. He didn't. He did well. Luckily, he had a guardian angel. And I'll be honest, I think you could say it too. The reason most of us end up not falling on our face sometimes is because God has sent somebody to guard over us. It's not us that's doing it. A parable. Why even speak in parables? Kind of an interesting concept because the disciples themselves asked Jesus that question. He had just finished telling a parable and they said, why do you speak to them in parables? And Jesus replies in Matthew 13, 11, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. He's saying to them is the world in general, to you are those who are in the relationship. And the word mystery was really a loaded word when he used this. In the time of Jesus, there was a number of what they called mystery religions. And how they worked is they had a, a, a type of liturgy to them. It was kind of like an insider's club. And if you were in this religion, it would make perfect sense to you what the words were. If you weren't, it was unintelligible. It didn't make any sense at all. The idea of the parables was your, I'm assuming, as we sit here in this church this morning, I'm talking to insiders, if I may say, those who are striving for the experience, those who are in a relationship and trying to make that relationship work. In the good model, we see how it works. God is working around you. In your relationship, you, you hear him calling you. You hear it inside. You see circumstances. You see what he's doing. You follow where he invites you. As far as the chocolate, Romans 8, 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. They did really well in the first service too. I said, okay, anybody remember 
the first verse we did in this series that we were memorizing, they all pretty much get in. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and me in him will bear fruit. When Ron were up here uh, doing this, Ron didn't have chocolate like me. He had the very same chocolate. Who was in Ron was in me, and who is in me was in Ron. And as we continued in our encounter together, we were in each other, and we would bear much fruit in the work we were doing. That's how it's supposed to work. It can't work unless, it doesn't work if you try to be like God. It's not going to work. You have to be filled with God. You have to be filled with God. Never like him, filled with him, and then you rest in that. The inattentive flaw of the follower, the inattentive Ron McSheep. One command, one invitation in seven he would listen to. Hmm, where do you think we were going with that one? One in seven. Well, coming on a Sunday morning, and this is the only time you hear God. This is the only time you're even open to it. You're like Ron. You may be where God was, but you'll never be where God is. You'll always be behind him. Because God moves in every day. He moves in every day. Uh, I, I stated this, take it as opinion if you want, but the idea that I've come to the conclusion, this is my, one of my convictions from God, that even if it's not a long time, it may be vital to start every day by giving it to God. Getting instructions from the master before the day starts. Giving the day, what do you want me to do in this day, Lord? What should I be looking for in this day, Lord? Even in his word. But starting the day, giving each day. Coming and hearing someone. Interesting thing, tell you, I, 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 I'm a, like human behavior studying it. I found the most interesting thing. You see over here we have this kind of circle-y thing over here. And really it's the small group thing. It's Saturday night right now, but when it's Sunday. No problem on Saturday night when we come and we're doing the, um, going over the principles and doing a lot of discussion. Everyone will come in and naturally sit in these seats here and we get discussing. On a Sunday morning, I have to pay people to sit up here <laughs> because they all want to sit uh, in rows in the back in the rows and and they said well I said well why are you doing that just because we don't like to look at each other <laughs> say the healthy church right no the point is is on a Sunday morning there's a mentality set in us I've come to receive some instruction I've come to, to, to hear and absorb something, but not so much in here interacting. We've been trained that way since we've been going to church. As you're a little kid, shh, be quiet in church. Why? Because we're absorbing information this way. And that's a good thing. We need good teaching. All of us do. However, even you think of the best pastor you ever heard, the best speaker you ever heard, and they, they told some story from their life and it inspired you, and man, you were just really moved by that story. But you know what that story was? It was secondhand, though. It taught you something, but it was secondhand. There's a danger if we never get beyond secondhand. There's a story in Scripture in Acts 19. Seven sons of Sceva was the story. Now, Sceva was a chief priest, and he had, obviously, seven sons. And this was around the time Paul was at his height going and, and doing all kinds. And Paul would heal people, and he'd do these miracles, and he would drive out demons. And they were very impressed with this. And they wanted to make a difference in the world. And so they decided they'd go into the exorcism business. So the seven of them decided to put it to work. And they just had one fatal flaw. They show up where this man who must have been notorious on, on how he was uh, uh, filled with this evil spirit. And they show up and they speak to the spirit and they say to him, seven of these young men around him, we command you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. What did they just say? 
they said, well, there's a great Jesus, and Paul's authentic, but our experience is secondhand. It's secondhand information. Well, okay, but what, is that so bad? Well, let's see how secondhand experience with God turns out. Acts 19, 15, 16. And the evil spirit, spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Man, when we try and do stuff for God, instead of through God, we end up naked and wounded. We get really chewed up. God just loves people working from, or uh, Satan just loves people working from secondhand experience. He eats them for breakfast. It's got to be a first-hand experience. And in all of this, you can get so busy like Ron McSheep going around and he came and he was there every seventh time and he was always where God was. Always where God was. This is the way they used to do it. Somebody else tried this and it worked really well. I'll try it too. They were always where God was, not where he is. An important thing that we have to have the relationship where it's not a one-day affair. It just doesn't work that way. It has to be. It has to be every day. I'm going to go a little out of order with these just because um, with the logistics it, it, it made sense. Another thing with Ron was at one point in the uh, illustration, Ron was crippled. And he was crippled uh, through atrophy, it was what we were talking about. Now, he had his sight, he had his hearing. It wasn't that he didn't believe in God, it wasn't that he didn't have a sensitivity to God, it's just he never moved. He just never moved. Oh, church people are never like that, right? We're never like that. Never moved out of the comfort zone, never stretched, never did anything to exercise those legs of faith. And what happens when he finally decides, I'm going to, God better call him somewhere in real tiny baby steps because he just couldn't move that fast. And if the atrophy was real, he wouldn't be able to carry that much either. Jesus says, take up my cross. Well, it better be a light cross because the muscles were all atrophied in Ronald McSheep in that. There was a time he was blinded. Distraction, that's all it takes. We live in what it's called, what, the digital age or the information age. Standing here, I could throw out some facts and you could sit there and double check me on your phone if you want to. And it happens in churches all the time. Or I could sit here and you could tune me out, even sitting here, and you would just sit there and answer your emails. You could do it. It's the information age. You go home, you turn on your TV, uh, you can get tied up in, in all kinds of things, in news and this, that, and the other thing. Uh, these things can go on. You can so easily, it doesn't even have to be bad things, just not God things. And, and you're just effectively blinded because you cannot see where God is working. You cannot see it. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 talks about pray without ceasing. That's an interesting line. I remember as a young Christian, I struggled with that a long time. How does a person pray without ceasing? I mean, I understand praying at the altar. I understand praying in your quiet time. But, you know, how, how do you, you know, driving down the road in your car, you, you, you're going to just trust the Lord and squint your eyes closed and pray? There must be a different definition we're working with there. And there is. Because prayer is simply two-way communication. Being ready at any moment to see or to hear where God is working. The prayer is something that's an attitude that never changes. Something that's not popular. And, and you know, books will do everything to stay away from talking about the spiritual disciplines because nobody likes that word. No one does. It, it's not fun. But when it comes down to it, a discipline simply routine. If you decided you needed to shed a, a, so many pounds or whatever, and you went on a diet, you would have to be disciplined every day. And you wouldn't see a lot, you know, for a while. 
but you'd have to be di disciplined consistently eating what you should and not eating. Uh, discipline if you decided to be a, a bodybuilder or, you know, you know, whatever, and you decide to get really in shape, it would take discipline. You know, you know, getting up in the morning and jogging or going to the club, every, you know, these things, it would take discipline. Spiritual disciplines exist too. There is, and a term I love from Blackaby is, he, I just heard him in a speech saying it once, but instead of just quiet time, he called it unhurried time. There is time you just need to stop. And now, like I say, it's great. I've heard this so many times. Yeah, I, driving to work, I talk to God, and I turn on K-Love, and then, you know, I get off on and love the tunes. And that's great. That's a, a way of worship, a great way to go to work. But it's not the unhurried, focused time. There's a time where everything else gets put aside, just like this, really. Here you are. Hopefully, if you're doing this right, when you were singing your worship songs, you were singing your worship songs. As somebody is up here trying to convey a little bit of God's truth, I have your attention. What a remarkable honor you have given whoever is standing here. You're undivided attention. Nobody gets undivided attention anymore. But it's a discipline to listen. Uh, so these disciplines in each day have to go on. If we don't, we start looking in other places. The hearing was much the same way. The way I look at it is in the fact that uh, you can be taught so much. Some of it is good. Some of it's irrelevant. You can take a class on anything, basket weaving, face painting, uh, you, know, you name it, you can take a class. You could listen to good ministers. You can listen to bad ministers because there's lots of both. You can have all kinds of words coming at your head. Jesus used a wonderful poetic mental picture. In, in Luke 7, 32, he says this. They are, and that is, he's not talking about the world in general. He's talking about people who were, in this case, he, Hebrews, God's people. Uh, and so that's the they in this. They are like children sitting in the marketplace. Now, first, put yourself in the mind. What was, in ancient cities, what was the big hubbub? It was like the city center mall, right? It was where everything was happening. They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to each other. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not cry. Those are very carefully chosen mental pictures. The first one is one of joy. How many aspects in Christianity are we supposed to have joy that it should make us happy? It's a, it's a fruit of the Spirit even. But then it, it switches the other way. We sang a dirge and you did not cry. A dirge is a song of death. A dirge is not a happy thing. It's the exact opposite. It is somebody is dying. And you should either have compassion or you should be fearful. Maybe that singing is for you. <laughs> Whatever the reason, you should be crying if you take it seriously, if you hear it. So here's the picture. A marketplace, there's God either playing with joy or, or giving a warning. All of us, like children, somewhere on the other side of that marketplace, taking everything else in and not hearing that voice at all just not hearing it. You should be joyful. No, no, I just get as far as lukewarm. You should be fearful. You should be worrying about that. You should have compassion for that. No, not hearing you. Muffled. It's muffled. And so is it any wonder when the still small voice comes, you don't hear it. I don't hear it. Uh, God speaking, sure he is, but I get on the muffs. I'm just taken up with everything else, tuned out. So easy to do. Indifference, indifference. When God speaks. And the worst of it all is we looked at all these things at the end as we said, okay, Ron, here you go. We're going to put everything on you. Because chances are in our, we either have an attitude in our walk with God in our relationship. We're doing all of those flaws to some level or we're working against them. So chances are, if you're giving into one, the rest of them are right there with it. 
And like the group said itself, what chance did Ronald McSheep have of following? Not a chance. Not a chance. Is it any wonder that, you know, people can come to church every now and then, that um, they can believe in God, they can know the church lingo, they can do it, but they never experience him. Never experience him. Maybe that's kind of the reason why. Maybe that's the reason why. And the Saturday evenings, as we said, we really strayed because uh, I'll give a disclaimer just, you know, for Blackaby that no, he didn't do Ronald McSheep and eat M&Ms in the service or anything. He's, he's, he's too classy a minister for that one. However, in all of this, the principles still applied. And on, on the Saturdays, when we go through the principles, there was a number of things that we covered. And I want to share with you this morning what we call the takeaways. Here are some things that we learn in the study of when God speaks. When God speaks, it will be out of a, out, out of a relationship that already exists. It will be out of a relationship that already exists. When God speaks, it will be unique to where you are with him. Unique to where you are with him. See, there was only one burning bush mentioned in the Bible. There was only one promised land. There was only one time Jesus called somebody out to walk on water. There was only one time that he walked along an Emmaus road. Those things only happened once. We don't live off of a second-hand experience. God has something unique to you. However, even that being said, there are universals. All through the Bible, all these invitations had two words usually that were with them. Follow me. Follow me. It always had the invitation for anyone who is going to be in this relationship, take up your cross and follow me. In this relationship, we are told, don't conform but transform. We're told that when God speaks, he is very clear. God didn't leave Noah guessing the dimensions of the ark. God didn't leave Moses to figure out what the boundaries were for the promised land. God told those apostles when they were rowing across the lake where they were going, God is very specific and when we hear from him, he'll tell us things. He won't tell us everything, but he'll tell you what you need to know to make the next step. God works that way. When God speaks, huh, get this one, he does not contradict himself. When God speaks, he does not contradict himself. If it can't be backed up by scripture, then it's not God. When God speaks, this is an encounter with God, not just leading to one. When God speaks, it is an encounter. When God speaks, you and I cannot understand the spiritual truth unless the Holy Spirit reveals it. Read your Bible, you do not discover its truth. It is revealed to you, not by your power. When God speaks the truth, the truth is not a concept, it's a person. When God speaks, it's not a concept, it's a person. See, when God reveals, that's why you need relationship with the Holy Spirit. The idea that truth is not a concept, but a person, that's why you must have a relationship with Christ. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. How do we discern? We have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16, really. When God speaks, he is more interested in what you become than what you do. He's more interested in what you become than what you do. When God speaks, he is inviting you to join him, and that will require an adjustment to your life. It will require an adjustment to your life. When God speaks, he is calling you to respond immediately. Now, does that mean you run out and do the first reckless thing that comes to your mind? No, but you respond because if nothing else, you are in a state of 
preparation. You are in a state of testing to see if that was really God. You are responding in some way immediately. And yes, and sometimes it does mean immediate action. Uh, some things don't need a whole lot of explaining. If God pricks your heart and says you need to forgive, you need to forgive now. If God tells you uh, things that he's already made obvious, you need to do those things now. When God speaks, your desire and my desire is not to do something for God, but to know God's will. The, the desire is not to do something for God, it's to know God's will. Otherwise, you're wasting your time. When God speaks, it will come to nothing if we give in to those five killers that we talked about. There's ways to miss God. Is he working around you? Absolutely. Can you miss him? Absolutely. Relationship. When's the last time God spoke to you? When's the last time you saw him working somewhere? When's the last time you accepted the invitation? When is the last time you were at your unique burning bush? It can happen anytime, but it takes the relationship. It takes the invitation, and then it takes the courage to follow through with it in the disciplines. When God speaks, you can hear him. You can follow him, and it will make all the difference in the quality of your life. All the difference. <laughs>